This is a teeny tiny piece of malware. It's a keylogger written in PowerShell. Granted, you might not be able to make too much sense of it right now because it's all encoded. It's Base64 encoding. Just a different representation of the data, but inside of my Kali Linux virtual machine, I can open up a terminal with Control-Alt-T, F11 to full screen, and zoom in a little bit so the text is bigger for us. And if I were to use a simple command that's accessible like Base64 and dash D to decode, we could actually redirect in this entire payload. Just as a string, we could use single quotes or double quotes. Back to our Base64 blob, we could start to highlight, select, and copy this entire thing, and then just paste it into the base64 command and it will then spit out the actual PowerShell. There's a lot here, so I'll zoom out and actually we could redirect that to a file. Now this is much more readable PowerShell code. There are a couple parameters defined at the top as to what it could take for arguments or options with some defaults for server address, server port, proxy address, and proxy port. Looks like they're using an onion address, a little bit clever using some communication over Tor, the onion router, or all those dark web things, and an IP address for a proxy address and the ports associated. 9050 is the usual proxy port for the onion router or Tor, so that's cool. Down below though, they actually pour in a little bit of C sharp. Now this is the real power with PowerShell, right? Is that you could always call back to other managed code. This is all defined as a string. Of course, in the quotes here, you can see all the yellow text. And they use the add type commandlet to have this functionality accessible even in the rest of the PowerShell code they might use. It looks like this is a stub just to be able to make the connection to the proxy. And there are some other functions defined like cap-sc, reading in some other assemblies that they use. Presumably it's gonna grab the width and height of your computer screen, take a screenshot, and then save it to a file with a random temporary name. They save that file, return it for the function value, and that's that. They have some other convenience functions to encode and decode base64 data, execute a command in memory with the invoke expression commandlet, basically eval in PowerShell, and some other functions to get system info. Really just retrieving different environment information, like the operating system, host name, running username, and their IP address. Down beneath that though, we see the functionality for our keylogger. Couple global variables for whether or not the keylogger is active and what keys we have captured. And there is a start keylogger function. Looks like this uses even more C-sharp syntax to kind of pull in other DLLs or dynamic link libraries. Now these are Win32 API functions that they might be able to call. Things specific to the core of Windows. Maybe some methods like get async key state, get keyboard state, map virtual key to Unicode. So what they do is they define these function delegates, kind of like a prototype as to how you would invoke that function. They use this signature variable with the dollar sign prefix as part of a now API variable where they're using add type once again to pull in a little bit more of that power. Then it starts a job. That means it can run asynchronously. It's not gonna block or wait for further things to happen, but it is gonna infinitely loop with the while true condition. Sleeps for about 40 milliseconds and then tries to loop through all of these ASCII values. Beginning with the number nine, less than or equal, Beginning with the number nine, while it's less than or equal to 254, it checks the key state, like each and every one of the keys on your keyboard. It basically determines, it checks if, based off the keyboard state, that keyboard key is pressed, and if it is, then it ends up adding that to a keylog.txt file. They hide that in your temporary directory based off the environment variable, but it is writing and logging all of the keys that are pressed, a keylogger. Other convenience functions to stop the keylogger based off that job, checking for keylog data based off of that keylog.txt file, and then the functionality to make the connections where it would actually try to exfiltrate this out to their command and control, like the server address that we saw in those variables. It looks like it's actually able to read some info from that C2 server, so it could provide other commands, whether or not it'll exit, stop the running program, stop the keylogger, or take a screenshot, or even run or execute other PowerShell commands or shell commands. Then there's other rat or remote access Trojan functionality, like upload and download files, or of course, start the keylogger. There is even another QT persist command apparently, but it doesn't do anything yet. 
Uh, there's some notes and a comment here, literal PowerShell comment, implement the logic for persistence as necessary. Uh, that will need to be done, I guess, in the future. Like, that's a to-do. There aren't any actual persistence mechanisms implemented in this. It just runs forever asynchronously with PowerShell jobs. It'll keep trying to connect to or establish a connection with the provided arguments, server address, proxy address, and it does this over and over and over again every minute. So tiny little sliver of malware, right? A PowerShell keylogger. But let me tell you, this PowerShell malware sample actually came from another awesome online cybersecurity training and learning environment. This came from Let's Defend. It's their PowerShell keylogger module. And while you're getting smarter and sharper in your whole cybersecurity career, journey in the industry, they give you this prompt. Look, say you're a malware analyst investigating a suspected PowerShell malware sample. Just as we saw, the malware is designed to establish a connection with the remote server, execute different commands, and potentially exfiltrate data. We want to figure out what it's doing and how it's doing it. And for your learning, Let's Defend gives you a handful of questions to check your understanding and work through this module, this challenge, and this lesson. And in case you haven't seen the news recently, Let's Defend actually joined Hack the Box. Another awesome cybersecurity training, cyber range, labs, and exercises to get better, sharper in your cybersecurity career. Let's Defend officially signed the agreement to be acquired by Hack the Box. But Let's Defend has always been about blue team training. They love to focus on the Security Operations Center, or the SOC. So Let's Defend built out a simulated Security Operations Center and whole environment that offers that hands-on realistic training. And Hack the Box does have some blue team and defensive focused content, but they always seem to lean a little bit more towards the offensive security. So this is pretty awesome. Big congrats to both teams. This is a community milestone. I really like how they put that. But I realized I don't think I've showcased a lot of Let's Defend before in other videos. I've never gotten a chance to show off some of the sweet stuff that they have. So I'm here on their website and there'll be a link below in the video description if you wanted to follow along. But they love to showcase education in a path. Give you something where you could move from one A to B, from one step, and then the next, and then another, and then all the things that make progress, make some momentum, and help you keep moving along in your career. Let me show you some of these paths. There are a lot of them, and this is awesome. Making a career switch into cybersecurity, maybe learning specifically digital forensics, incident response, security information event management, programming, AWS, Google, malware analysis, and the SOC analyst learning path. I know a lot of folks probably gonna see a lot of jobs in the security operations center. So there's a lot to cover here. Learn the technical skills necessary for a career in the security operations center, and they break it down give you the fundamentals, tell you about all the things that you need to know, and then it's awesome because you'll have questions, quizzes, challenges, practice labs and environments all along the way. And by the way, from their learn section, you could of course drill down into any of these specific courses or lessons or challenges or quizzes, and they have this all accessible for you. And you could easily, right up at the very top, we could toggle or use any filters that we might like for any job that you're interested in, like a security analyst, like an incident responder, like a detection engineer, like this is all to help jumpstart you on your work. If you wanted to follow along or even try some more of these on your own, different challenges, different courses, different education, paths, lessons, quizzes, even some prep for different certifications. Look, there's a link in the video description. And of course, Let's Defend is always offering a sweet free tier. But of course, there is an awesome Black Friday deal where they're doing 50% off, literally half off. That discount code is Black Friday with the A and I letters removed, AI removed, I like that. You can use that for VIP, VIP plus, and I believe there is even toggling that to monthly, you could use Black Friday 35. So you could get either a monthly or annual plan. If you are a student, however, they already always offer a 50% discount for students, which is wild. They verify with your student email address and then you could get 50% off and 50% off Black Friday based off of the student discount code and the Black Friday deals. Kind of neat. I also have my own sweet little discount code. If you were going to snag an annual plan, you could use a discount code. And let me uh, right click, change the text here. It'd be fun. John 55 
That one will get you 55% off an annual plan, and I believe that's active for at least, I think, two weeks after this video releases. So please, jump at it. And they have a full-blown security operation center like SOC Simulation. If you jump over to the Practice tab, you can see in the monitoring section I'm in, all these different alerts with their severity, with their details. Maybe we could drill down into anything that we're curious about and understand a little bit more as to what would we go triage and analyze and understand what to track down next. If you wanted to see even more telemetry, the log management section shows you all the different things that it could pull some info from and, of course, drill down into this so you've got a similar interface to what you're probably going to be working with in the real security operation center. Even making up different cases for specific incidents, looking at things from a specific endpoint. And this is really cool. We could actually drill down into, hey, what's happening on the SharePoint server? What's going down on any of the other boxes that we really want to see what processes are running where and when and how? Toggle that to network action, terminal history, maybe browser history, all the things that help triage and analyze in an incident. Here I jumped over to the email security section and maybe we're getting an idea for, oh, some of the threats, some of the other info that could come through. And these are all things just to get you acquainted and familiar with what's the security operations center analyst like daily routine. So that could help in different interviews or different employment opportunities out there for your career. Looking at indicators of compromise, working inside of a sandbox, you could even spin up these labs, which is super cool. Well, this one spins up. In fact, you might have noticed the PowerShell keylogger that we started with actually includes its own lab environment as part of the challenge. And we'll roll through a little CAPTCHA here. Once that is done, then we'll spin up our own machine. So you don't have to download anything when you're walking through any of the Let's Defend material. It's all in the browser and makes it super easy to spin up. All right, so my lab has spun up and we can see we could interact with a Windows virtual machine here. I do have the challenge file or the folder on my desktop and that was the sample 7-zip that we could go ahead and extract. Might as well extract it here. The password they told us above was infected. Just the usual malware where sample standard password. And this file, CHA or CHA, was that PowerShell keylogger that we were exploring. Opening this with Notepad++, yep, exact same syntax that we saw previously. It wasn't Base64 encoded, I just kind of put that in so we have a little bit more, ooh, cutesy fireworks for the start of the video, whatever, you know. So let's roll through some of the questions here. It asks, what is the proxy port used by the script? Well, we saw 9050, correct? Excellent, that's correct. What function method is used for starting the keylogger? Well, I think that was pretty simply called start keylogger, right? Submit that, correct. What is the name of the file used by the script to store the keylog data? We saw that in like the temporary directory under the file name keylog.txt, I believe. What is the command used by the script to achieve persistence? Uh, we saw that in like the strings that were kind of interpreted based off of what the command and control or C2 server sent us, right? It was persist. Yep. Did I get the other one above? Good. What is the command used by the script to upload data? I think that was just upload. Okay. So small, simple stuff getting us grooving here. Oh, you're very close to the right answer. What did I miss? Looking back at this syntax, I could have sworn... It was upload. What am I misremembering? Oh, there's a colon at the end. That's all? Is that all it needs? Upload colon. How about that? Yeah. What is the regex or the regular expression used by the script to filter IP addresses? Oh, I remember seeing that, but we do have a get unstuck option here in case you ever needed a little bit more help or a hint. You could ask in the forum or in Discord or even just click the button, oh, view the hint for this question. Focus on the script section that checks for specific IP ranges. Okay, we saw that previously, didn't we? Yeah, it was in the beginning for get system info. This function here, they use this PowerShell command, get net IP address, where the address family is equal to IPv4 and the address does not match this regular expression. So special magic syntax, caret symbol for the very start of a string. Inside of parentheses, we have a group where there are options. The first option is a one, two, seven literal characters and a backslash to escape out a dot or a period for literal representation of a dot. And then one, six, nine dot literal, two, five, four, literal dot. So it's this, this is the regular expression that we're looking for, but that's to determine, oh, is this a local IP address or something kind of like within the network? Let's go ahead and paste that there. 
Good. What is the DLL imported by the script to call keylogging APIs? Oh, we saw that in the start keylogger function, just the very beginning. That was that user32.dll, like the dynamic link library, right? That is the Windows natural installed library that's part of the file system, part of your path. They could import it easily with this little header, DLL import, and user32.dll is the answer that we want. Good? How many seconds does the script wait before reestablishing connection? Wasn't it just 40? But it was like 40 milliseconds, right? Am I misremembering? It tries to establish a connection, but the actual call for that is here in that main loop. Yeah, okay, no, just 60 seconds. It's, it's a minute. I was looking at like 40, I could have sworn it was milliseconds. Yeah, okay, different part of the code. The established connection down here, start, sleep for 60 seconds. So 60, how about that? All right, we did it. <laughs> All righty, simple showcase today. Just a little PowerShell malware, PowerShell keylogger that still ties itself back to some sweet learning, more education that you might be able to take some good advantage of during the holiday season. Hope you snagged that Black Friday deal. Hope you go check out Let's Defend. Big congrats to them on the acquisition and joining up with Hack the Blocks. Super cool stuff. Please do give them some love. Link below in the video description. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video.